Well, good morning, everyone. And I think the fact that the room is pretty much packed, and I gather that the session was registered as full about 24, 48 hours ago, shows that we're discussing a very important topic today, which is of great interest to many people at this year's Davos gathering. And the topic is the sprint to 2020. 2020 is a very important point, because that will be halfway through the Sustainable Development Goal process. And it's going to be a very important point at which people can actually start measuring whether they think the entire initiative is or is not working. And what's important to emphasize, and one of the points that we're going to be drawing out today, is that what is at stake right now is not just a question of what the goals are and whether they will be hit, the 17 goals, which I'm sure that most of us in the room can recite off by heart, I hope might pick on some of you later and ask you if you know what the goals are. Um, but also, the process by which the goals are being not just defined, but implemented and pushed forward. Because of course, there is something very significant about the way the sustainable development goals are being um, implemented. Unlike the Millennium Development Goals, this is not a top-down process. It's not just UN-driven. It's very much about partnership with business, with a range of institutions, national governments, scientists, NGOs, and it's much more bottom-up in its process, much more driven by the emerging markets. So we have a fantastic group of people to talk about how this process is going this morning. On my immediate left is Paul Bolker, who runs Nestle, a giant of the corporate landscape, who's been very involved in pushing forward the SDGs. Next to him is Afsane Beshlos, who has previously was a luminary on the economic side of the World Bank and is now involved in the private sector financial world, running a fund, fund management, asset management group in Washington. Um, we have Dr. Ling, who is from China, who is, plays a leading role in the whole energy sector and, the, and discussions there, who runs, and I'm going to check, I get the name right, the China Energy Investment Corporation, one of the giants from China. And on my immediate right is President Santos of Colombia, who has been very involved in pushing forward the SDGs and as in his role in Colombia is now very actively trying to promote this both at a national and international level. So I'd like to start with you, Professor Santos, sorry, President Santos. I just upgraded you. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want to do after I'm president. Being All right, a become a professor. I think you have an MBA, don't you, already? And do you have a doctorate or a...? No, I, no. no not yet. Not yet. <laughs> okay. Um, well, President, El Presidente, um, I'd like to start by asking you um, to tell us a bit about how you see the SDGs as being different from the Millennial Development Goals and where you see the initiative really is at the moment in terms of pushing it forward. Yes. W when we first thought about the SDGs that we finally proposed in the Rio Summit of 2012, uh, the rationale was uh, the Millennium Goals were only for developed countries. And uh, it was a commitment for developed countries to fight poverty. And we said, uh, this is not enough. The world is one. Everybody has to be on board. And the developed countries must also participate. So we started to see how and how to link uh, poverty with the environment. And how, that's how the SDGs emerged. Um, Y17, it was a, uh, the result of a transaction. There was a big discussion how many uh, goals would be uh, viable, uh, convenient, and we, we ended up with 17, with 164 sub-items. And uh, you mentioned something which is very important. Uh, Paul Bulk, uh, we, we discussed this about this. How, from now on, can we push forward and how to make them operative? This is a big challenge. In our case in Colombia, we are very committed with the SDGs. We were the first country who put them into our legal system. They're, they're a law, and uh, we have to comply by law. Uh, but that's not enough. We have to bring in the private sector, and for each sub-item of the 164, we have a special plan with the private sector, and um, we have intermediate goals in order to be able to fulfill every single goal. So it has to be an integrated 
process with the private sector, uh, practical. If you, if you want to achieve the goals, you have to be practical. And uh, now the great challenge is to push forward. Um, and uh, so that was how the SDGs emerged. And now the, the big goal right now is to make them work and to achieve the goals. So you have 164 different task forces, is that correct? Yes, we, we, we have an internal procedure. Every government has its own ways of uh, dealing with the problem. But we have a sort of a sub-cabinet um, instance where the main policies are approved. And there's a very thick document, uh, especially for SDGs, which are already in our laws. Uh, that forces all the uh, the different uh, agencies of the government to work on each of the 164. Wow. And uh, we're right now in the process of bringing the private sector into each item. Right. Maybe I should ask you if, if you can recite all 164. <laughs> I, I have to take my computer out. All right. Well, it's a huge <laughs> logistical exercise, and it's certainly very striking that you now have a system in place for doing that. I'm curious as to how many other countries actually have that level of organization and commitment right now. I, 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 I'm sorry, but not many. Uh, we, we've, been, we've been with the United Nations following that and we're promoting. We're asking countries to, to share with us their experience and we share with them. And But many other countries are, are getting on board because it's also a very useful tool for any, any country, especially emerging countries, as a, as a way to control and to stimulate development. Exactly. Uh, well, checklists are good. And in fact, one of the great things about the SDGs is that they do provide a checklist and a way to benchmark and a framework for everyone to talk about in a common way. But I'd like to bring in Paul here because, as I said earlier, one of the differences between the SDGs and the MDGs is obviously the fact that you do have the private sector taking a leading role. Um, do you have a 164-point checklist inside Nestle, which is looking at these goals? Or how are you getting involved from the private sector role in actually implementing these SDGs? We do have quite a few uh, targets inside our company. But first of all, I don't think private sector has a leading role. Uh, we have a role. Uh, but first of all, the title, Sprint to 2020, is, is wrong in the sense of a sprint towards, it's like it ends there. And at the end of the day, it's only a milestone somewhere to, to, to measure, to see how we advance. The, the, the sustainable development goals are actually not goals, it's more a framing, it's an ambition, not a target. So uh, let's just put that clear. And, and, and it's a fantastic framework that helps them to, to, to converge many, many actions. And, um, and actually, the problem of this is also in the title of the forum, which is uh, creating a shared future in a fractured world, is actually going against that somewhere, we fractured. And, um, so the, the chief complexity of, of, of what we want to do, development and, and sustainability, climate change and sustainability are, are so huge uh, that you actually have to, what uh, the President Santos says is, you have to decompose these big ambitions into actionable operational dimensions. And we as companies uh, um, can act that, that in the sense that we, through our supply chains, through our activities, we have to frame our ambition and our purpose as a company in such a way that, that we, through everything we do, we um, have a positive link with society. Um, and that is uh, what we call internally Nestle, creating shared value. So we, we have to create shareholder value. That's, uh, that, that's our livelihood. That's how we can exist over time. But yet at the same time, we have to combine our actions through positive interaction with society. And that is uh, uh, what we have built in. Uh, the, the sustainable development goals are our framing internally of how we interact with society and everything we do. 
uh, uh, with farmers, and, and, and we have many examples also in Colombia, and we're working together uh, directly uh, with President Santos on coffee and, and many other areas. Um, on, on our uh, um, internal uh, uh, walls in the sense of creating jobs, having factories all over the world and having our values played in there, uh, producing con uh, for consumers uh, products that are uh, nutritious and, and, and fortified. So y y through all actions, you have to decompose that into actionable dimensions. Right. And then you have to operationalize that. You have to build it into your uh, company's uh, uh, way of being, your purpose. And as such, we are we, we, we sharing of the world every year now for quite five years our commitments. And we have over 40 commitments that are all linked with the Sustainable Development Goals somewhere. I think the Sustainable Development Goal was a fantastic thing where the private sector was involved in to define it for the first time. That is a precondition of having them then involved. An example of actionable things is I'm, I'm, I have the privilege of co-chairing the Water Resource Group. The Water Resource Group came out of this, this environment also, and, where, and it is now uh, um, hosted by the World Bank, uh, where we can uh, concrete go to a government and, and together with uh, local civil stakeholders and the companies to do um, uh, water sustainability or water availability and, and go against the water uh, issue, which is a major issue. And, and water is a local thing. It's a global problem, but then you have to go local. And the thing very important there is that governments should own the things. It's not private sector. They have to be part of it. But the government should own it, frame it, and that is exactly what President Santos said. Right. If, if that is not done, we're going to continue doing what we want, uh, what, what we want to achieve, which is this creating shared value. But the scale, the sheer scale that we need for these complex issues is to be brought by framing. And not, you see, the problem with, and the nicety about the Economic Forum here is that we talk and we all agree. We, uh, well, the state we don't of the yet know everyone agrees. No, but, but, but <laughs> look, who can, we, who can go against the uh, Sustainable Development Goals that we want to do this? Now, that's a good expression of ambition. But how do you make that operational? Right. And, 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 and then, really, you have to go to operational, actionable things. Now, companies can act, and they can scale up another group. The Consumer Goods Forum, where you have the manufacturers and retailers coming together and, 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 and go towards these big challenges. Deforestation, we have right. a commitment there. Food waste, <coughs> we want to reduce to half the food waste in, 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 in the whole system of manufacturers and, and, and retailers. These are all things that are and should and that is what the sustainable development goals do, they should converge then, right. come together. And, uh, and here we can talk, and we can set agendas and priorities, but then it has to go out. Once you go out of Davos, we have then to go, and it's governments that has to frame. Right. Well, we're going to come back to some of those specific issues in a moment to do with agriculture, water, because certainly things like agriculture very much are the new frontier or the next frontier that people are focusing on in this discussion about sustainability. But before I do that, I'd like to turn to Dr. Lin, because you are very much part of the energy um, drive um, as head of um, China Energy Investment Corporation. Can you tell me how, in China, the goals are perceived and um, how you're trying to implement some of them in China and work with partners around the world? Um, I believe that you'll be speaking in Chinese, so the audience may wish to put on their headsets at the moment. Okay, thank you for your question. Oh, okay, I, no. <laughs> I answer question, can I make a very brief presentation of a company? We are the largest uh, energy company in China, just uh, after the merger between the you know, two largest uh, energy companies, Shenhua Group and the China Golden Group. So I can answer this question. So like in China, you know, in the past 40 years, we solved the problem of uh, we have 1.3 billion population to give the enough room for you know, the, uh, the food for them to eat and also solve the problem of poverty. So now, during the past several years, Talking about the energy sector, we give the enough energy to serve, to give support to the energy supply. But now, 
after you know we enter into a new era uh, for China, we should make two things in the energy sector. Number one is the amount of energy we want to give them sustainable uh, and very clean, very efficient. And second thing is how to solve the problem environment-friendly issue. For example, in China, everybody talking about the problem smokes, the smoke and frogs, very bad thing. But we are getting better to reduce the emission. So that's in the past. And talking about 2020, you know, uh, Chinese government has made a target that, you know, for 2020 we have a target. We want to, you know, make so-called, you know, the the moderately prosperous society. That means we will get about 40 million poverty population to delete that number. So everybody get into the above the basic living standard. So for that, we as the largest energy company, we will do our best, one, to give the enough supply for energy, and two, we want to make our supply more clean, more efficient, and even we want to solve all of the pollution problems. So that means high efficiency and low emission. Thank you. And how do you think your rate of progress is going in terms of the goals? Okay. And how do you think, how do you look at the level of international collaboration? Okay. Because climate change can only be alleviated with maximum collaboration mm -hmm. in all the countries. Yeah. And yet we have, for example, America, which has recently indicated is not moving at the same pace as others. <clears throat> okay. So, now, can I say it in one word? We need collaboration. So, about the uh, climate change, you know, first, we have done a lot in this area. For example, we have made it the first CCS facilities, carbon capture and storage, and we have already made the injection of CO2 more than 300,000 tons into the earth. So we have the technique. But you know, it cannot be a good business model because we cannot get the money back. So how to solve the problem? We have two ways. One is to make CCUS, make the utilization. Instead of water, we can help the oil <coughs> production and also we can find some good way to change the CO2 to the resources we can utilize. So that's two, two routes. So we want to have uh, the international collaboration. And actually, before, we have a lot of international collaboration with the universities, with the laboratories, with other large companies, including Europe and uh, the States. So in future, we think, we do think, the climate change is not a pure uh, commercial question. It should be the human beings is our you know, common social responsibilities. So we will do our best to have this kind of collaboration. Right. Thank you. Well, Alsane, you have a very interesting insider-outsider perspective because you used to work at the World Bank but now you are in the private sector financial world as an asset manager. And certainly, until quite recently, much of the asset management community, the financial sector, was quite cynical about the SDGs. How do you see this so-called sprint to 2020? Do you think progress is being made? I think uh, it, we're at a really interesting juncture. Um, if you asked me the same question even six months or a year ago, I would have said cynical, not interested, moving very slowly. I would say, just like what the president was saying about sort of at the governmental level, what you're seeing now is consumers and the millennials and the next generation and kids in college 
are pushing companies, they're pushing the financial sector through their savings, and as there will be the largest transfer of savings from one generation to the next generation, really in the next uh, 10 years, uh, they're really pushing for the SDGs or some of them, in so far as they can understand them. They may not understand every 164 sub-item, but they understand the major uh, categories, um, to actually move into the financial sector. What do I mean by that? About um, 120 trillion is managed across pension funds, sovereign funds, um, you know, pension funds in local uh, emerging markets, private savers, insurance companies. That's a lot of assets. Uh, about three to four trillion gets added every year. That is the amount we're talking about if we want to get the SDGs actually implemented. And I think where I beg to differ a little bit is that I think they are benchmarks, the SDGs, they are targets. At the same time, there are necessities. You know, when um, you're in Beijing now, you're not just looking at the SDGs, you're not just looking at climate change accord. The question is, if you want to go out and breathe and if you want children not to get sick, you have to have clean air. It's not, it's not something you just signed off on. So I think all of these things are now things that the financial sector is realizing is good business. So if we look at it just purely from a financial sector point of view, when you look at the SDGs, let's take emerging markets. Uh, fastest growth rate uh, will be in the consumer sector, 1.4 trillion, uh, 1.4 billion new consumers will be added in the, to the middle class. So everybody, you know, whether you're sitting in Nestle or you're sitting, you know, running a com uh, country um, or making sure that people have energy, you really need to make sure that those needs are fed through the financial sector, of course. Uh, the other thing is that through the financial sector, it used to be that, as you said, um, uh, people thought that the word SDGs or the word impact or the word, any of these words meant negative returns. Today, people know that if you invest in solar or, uh, or wind, it actually is good business. Uh, replacing um, natural gas for coal or replacing solar in many places uh, is good business. Health sector in emerging markets is one of the fastest growing areas in any any sector, anywhere in the world. So if you look on a two-year, four-year, five-year, seven-year, 10-year basis, uh, health sector growth in emerging markets is faster than most other sectors. You know, we talk about technology, the disruptions <coughs> in technology, which also are, are going to change a lot of things. But I would beg to say you have to go fast, <coughs> not slow, on, uh, on the implementation. Uh, for the financial sector, for a single company, I think you can't go with the 17. Um, you might choose the few that you're involved in mm. and then actually come up with concrete um, areas. And that's what I'm seeing with the financial sector, right. where people are taking the things that they care about or they're involved in and actually turning them slowly, slowly. What, they, what is missing is a marketplace information for them so that if you are interested in investing, let's say, in water or health or energy, how do I find the best projects? Well, that's a great point. Sorry. No, but hearing Ms. Specialist, I'm very happy to hear what she's saying because when the SDGs were conceived and we thought about them, we thought that the, the basic objective was to change mindsets, change behavior. Mm. And uh, what you're saying about young people pushing, mm -hmm. uh, maybe they don't know really what the SDGs are about, but they're pushing the main objectives I think that's the goal that we need in the world. The, the, yeah. the SDGs were, in a way, implemented to do that, to change behaviors. Yes. And I think it's starting to work. Uh, and uh, that is but, very important. Well, you see, I, I, I completely agree. I mean, I must say, from my position at the Financial Times, I should have explained earlier, I oversee the American operation of the Financial Times. One thing we've noticed from our own readers is there's been a huge upsurge in interest in pieces about impact investing. Whenever we have conferences on impact investing, we get tremendous take up from the FT readers. And I would really echo Asane's point that um, the millennial generation of investors who are about to inherit a huge amount of money in the next 10, 20 years, certainly have a very different concept of investing. And they are interested in blending social goals together with financial investing. I mean, whether that 
desire lasts um, during a period when the financial markets may not be quite so exuberant, who knows? But at the moment, that's very much part of the um, framework. So it's more a question, I think, of the Sustainable Development Goals catching a wave rather than actually generating this. But I'm curious, from your point of view, when you hear people talking about impact investing, does that make you feel a bit cynical or...? No. Definitely. The pressure is, is I call it pressure, is, is, is mounting from the outside. Consumers are starting to ask questions, Millennium Syndrome, if you want, and also some investors. Uh, so the pressure from the outside is mounting. But by no way we're going to get there because of external pressures. I think it's by conviction and, and beliefs and pressure from the inside also of the operators, uh, companies, for example. Because let's face it, uh, there's quite a, a big gap between talk, intentions, um, political correctness, and, and facts, um, and, and behaviors, real behaviors. And still, we have to bridge that. It is definitely changing. It's definitely creating the pressure from the outside to the framing. There's more investors saying, hey, I want to know how you get there. Um, uh, and that's actually the whole discussion about short term, long term that we have quite a bit here. In, in, uh, and when you see things in the long term, then it is normal. You start to valorize the water, valorize in the sense of giving it value. And then your equations start to, to change. I think that's an obligation too. It is companies should maintain this framing in the longer term. We are a 150 years old company. I want to be 150 years there too. If I want to do that, then I have to care for resources. I have to make sure that the 1.3 billion consumers are getting in and staying in because that's, that's my livelihood too. Right. And society as such too and governments and all. So it's that long-term perspective on things that gives things a different uh, value per se. Right. Pressure is mounting. But I must say, it's not all the same because uh, there's still a lot of short-term pressure of delivering results, quarterly reporting. We, we know all the discussions. I'll, I'll give you an, a concrete example of how pressure does work. Uh, pressure from the consumers. And uh, the proof is Nestle, big buyer of coffee in Colombia, big producer of coffee. The same coffee, uh, whether it's organic or not, the price difference is huge. And the peasant is receiving three or four more times if it's organic coffee than if it's not. And why is that pressure from the consumers? I think there is a, a, a an element again, of, 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 of the movement, of the change of behavior, which is having an impact on, on the way the companies and the governments work. May I pick up on that example, for example? Uh, the coffee, we have projects together because Coffee is important to, We're proud to you it. and to us. I, mean, I think coffee is important to everyone at this time of the morning. Yeah, but, <laughs> but we have concrete projects in the sense of uh, uh, organic and, and, and yields and farmer livelihoods and, 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 and so on. We have projects in there. How we can then close that gap of price differentiation where then science, technology, research comes in and then give that dimension a, a livable uh, uh, economically plausible uh, future. We, we, we can choose plantlets, and that's what we do, and, 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 and give them so that the yields are four times more per square meter. We speak about land usage and all. That is possible when there is cooperation because so many of good intentions are evaporating because they're not sustained in time. That's hence where governments should frame and companies should stay and commit for the longer term. I think uh, uh, these are very good examples of, of also something good for uh, uh, development, uh, good for the planet, is also, if you uh, see it in gain in, in, in time frames, it's good for, I would say, business in the positive uh, sense of the word. But can I quickly ask, Paul, have you had any shareholders come to you, big shareholders, and say, what are you doing about the SDGs? Oh, yes. And more and more of these discussions we do have. And, they, and that's why we have explicit, we have, you can see it on our web page, we have committed for years now on, on, on commitments, and not commitments in 2050, because that's easy, you're not going to be there, so I commit. Um, no, it's, it's in three years' time, and we have concrete measurable things, and we measure every year and report back to the public how we go about it. It's 42 that we have this year, and it's very concrete. And it is, it, it is all lined up with the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. So that's to converge. That's what we can do. And then we work also in, in a more broader sense in collaboration with 
uh, other companies like the Consumer Goods Forum or the Water Resource Group that I just mentioned that is working with governments. Concrete uh, examples are, are to be found there too. And the World Bank that you know is, is now hosting that. So uh, it, that is, you have to make it operational, build it into your system or your company, but then report back not on in 50 years time, next year, the year after, concrete examples. I'd just like to bring Dr. Ling in here for a second and then turn to Athane um, and ask, obviously in China, there is a level of concern amongst some citizens about the environment <coughs> and that has been actively helping the government to refocus on this and we've seen great progress in terms of air quality in cities like Beijing. Yeah. Do you think there is any real pressure from the Chinese public now to embrace the sustainable development goals in a wider sense, mm -hmm. given that certainly in the West we're seeing millennials starting to push for more change? Do you feel that the Chinese public is with the leadership in terms of trying to push forward these goals? Yes. Uh, can I say, you know, Chinese government is very serious to make the detailed plan to carry out that kind of plan. And as Chairman Xi, if we take an example about, you know, uh, Paris Agreement, you know, uh, Chairman Xi had made a decision and uh, back all of the ministers, you know, back to China, we have the detailed plan and uh, for all of the public companies, uh, private companies, we must do because it become the, not only the approval pr procedure, but a change to laws, change to regulations is very important. I can take an example. Now, China Energy, our company, is the largest energy company. And uh, by the end of last year, we have a total renewables, you know, total 21.5%. Although, you know, in China, the government says that the plan is by the end of 2030, the average you know, for renewables must be above 20%. But we have already 21.5. And we have set a target by the end of 2020, we will increase that number to 25. So that's a real action to how made one, traditional energy be more efficient, more clean, and two, the renewables very fast growing so that we can change that kind of, uh, uh, you know, the, the demand. And also in the area of uh, to, to save the waters, to, you know, to uh, make, you know, for example, we large amount of uh, power in China. We have coal, turbine, not oil and gas. So we must solve the problem. And as our company, we have this kind of technique. We made the main pollutants much lower than the gas turbines standard so that we use, we burn the coal, but we can make it more clean even than the gas turbine. So we can solve the problem. Right, thank you. Thank I, you. Cannot, I cannot resist uh, saying the following. Okay. Um, Oh, but please, please go ahead. Go ahead, uh, please. Um, Colombia is one of the, uh, it's the richest country per square kilometer in terms of biodiversity in the whole world. And we are one of the most vulnerable countries in terms of, of the effect of climate change. So um, I am the president of Colombia and I say, Colombia first. We are. We, 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 <laughs> That's quite a familiar theme right now on the global stage. Every head of state wants. Say it a bit louder, perhaps. And, in and Spanish. Any, any head of state wants their their uh, their country to do uh, the the best best possible. But in this discussion, uh, Colombia first means we have to collaborate with the rest of the world. I'll give you a concrete example of something that's happening today. We are trying to promote the savings of the Amazon corridor. It's called the AAA, Andes, Amazon, Atlantic. Uh, I was uh, just a week ago there, and we need the collaboration of Brazil, of Peru, of Ecuador, uh, the whole country that has the corridor. If we don't collaborate, Colombia by itself can do absolutely nothing. So this is something which is very, very important. 
uh, it has to be uh, a global, and uh, everybody has to chip in. Right. Uh, you cannot say, uh, I'm going to do it, or it's in my own interest to save my piece of water or my piece of jungle or my piece of forest, because that would be completely fruitless. So I have to ask, before I go to Afsane, I just want to quickly ask, so, as I mentioned earlier, we do have a situation today where the biggest economy in the world, America, appears to be at best lukewarm in terms of embracing this collaborative um, initiative on climate change, um, at least at the federal level, not at the state or municipal level. How much of a blow is it to the efforts to implement these sustainable goals, the fact that America has been somewhat lukewarm in terms of supporting some of these goals? Any of you care to comment? I think what has been really interesting is that the top down, as you said, has been you know, exactly what you said from a top federal level. The bottom up, which is what we're talking about, again, um, consumers, shareholders um, are putting pressure on companies. So if you look at the rhetoric of companies, I believe it hasn't changed. Financial sector is the glue, sort of. And, and as people who are buying the goods and as people who are uh, financing uh, those have continued consistently uh, on the same path, at least my very strong impression, and when we look at the numbers, is that there has been no weakening right. uh, in the US. In fact, if anything, um, I see that there has been, you know, we were on a path that was sort of uh, going slowly towards uh, supporting the SDGs and supporting specifically parts of it, like climate change. Uh, whereas in the last year, that interest to me seems to be much, much higher. Uh, foundations that I'm involved in on the boards um, had been talking about a lot of these things. In the last year, you know, Ford Foundation allocated a billion to, um, to sustainable investing. Uh, World Resources Institute, we used to look at our endowment in a very broad way. We've changed the way we manage that endowment. So you see a, a major, major right. shift. So well, what Donald Trump's done on climate change has actually sparked a counter-reaction. Seems so. I can well, see that you're all dying to come in now. So <laughs> <laughs> Paul but, but, and then Dr. Link. One, one sentence. Bottom up helps. Definitely, and it's still there. Top down would help too. Oh. <laughs> right. So a bit of leadership as well would be. Dr. Link. OK. So we still remember that the main two economies, United States and China, you know, we make the approval of this Paris Agreement by the President Obama and Chairman Xi. We know that. But you know, this year, oh, last year, I'm sorry, last year they changed mind. So from China perspective, I do say, one, there is no any influence on that because you know, for the, all of the state-owned enterprises and private companies, we will do the same things because Chairman Xi has made a decision. We carry out that kind of detailed plans. And two, from the government, their policy is still very sustainable to support, say, the renewable energies, to, to pro protect the, you know, the environment, et cetera. For example, the solar PV tariff, they still gave the policy, the tariff, to support that. And three, from all of the financial institutes, banking sector, uh, they still keep the same, same direction to support that kind of uh, uh, policy. So I do believe in China, we'll do the same things. No matter how any other countries change the demand, we do the same thing. Because Chairman Xi has made a decision, and all of the Chinese companies will do the same things. So right. I do believe in China, we, there is no any influence. Right, so in China there is top-down implementation. Um, <laughs> seems like a good moment to ask for any questions um, from the audience. Um, it would be courteous but not compulsory to identify yourself. And since we do have a number of people in the room who are experts and probably would like to say something, do please identify yourself. I believe that there are some roving microphones for anyone who'd like to ask questions. I can see just that and then over there and then there. 
And um, sorry, I'll look behind. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, and uh, thank you for, to the panel for the good discussion. My name is Barry Martin. I'm with Rabobank. I'm uh, responsible globally for the Food and Agri organization. Um, we finance more than 100 billion into ag globally. We have millions of clients. The big issue, and uh, you said you would talk about it, but you didn't go to the ag sector. But I, I do want to, to go. So thank you. Yes. Uh, <laughs> the thing is that what we have been noticing in our activities as a financier is that actually we have not put price on resources. So there is no incentive actually in a low margin business as, as agriculture to go into and change your practices. We have been trying to give discounts in rates for good practices, but that's not enough. So um, in, in the case of, 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 of the investment, what we have seen that they have been investing in projects and not really in the day-to-day -day running of your farm. And, Mr. Santos, you and you mentioned uh, uh, organic. Yes, is good, but for climate specifically, it doesn't mean that organic is better, right? So uh, I'm not qualifying it. I just say it doesn't mean that, right? Um, so what I think that didn't happen with the SDGs was actually putting a price of good behavior. Mm. And just I'm throwing this in for the discussion because I do think that to get money talks, and if we don't go after our money and put money it's not going to change. Right. Thank you. Let's, um, I think, I'd love to hear from all of you, well, three of you about that, because of course, as I mentioned earlier, agriculture in some ways hasn't been the focus until very recently. Mm -hmm. The focus has been on energy and other elements of poverty reduction. But agriculture is coming into focus this year at this year's meeting. So, Afane and then Paul, yeah. Um, I think, um, I think two or three things. One is obviously, you know, as, as uh, more people all over the world are becoming wealthy and eating uh, more, uh, not always healthier, but more, let's say meat, and that is such an energy intensive uh, product. Um, so, and I think that, um, you know, cows can create a lot of uh, climate related uh, issues. So, so one is that you're having huge still demographic change in emerging markets and, um, and with that uh, demand for food and uh, push on uh, producing certain kinds of food which are not as uh, positive in terms of what we talked. Obviously, SDGs can't, can't protect everything and cover everything. But if we remember, you know, when we all were at school, when we studied economics, it was uh, capital, labor, right? Water, um, the soil the air were not valued. I think as we, and, and you know, if you talk to the Nobel Prize uh, economists, some of them are here, there's still an issue about, uh, about valuing those. So SDGs cannot necessarily be you know, where we look for solving all of these problems. But when you are re uh, reading all the stories in the FT, in fact, had a recent story on water shortage, and you've done a lot of previous work in your anthropology studies. In, and you know, many populations in the world are, are having serious issues with water. It's going to create wars and other problems in the, in the future. We can live without oil. We can't live without water. And, um, and so that is huge. And there is still not a clear financial uh, price for it, but it is starting to become a major political economic issue. And I would wager to say that kids going to study economics probably in five years, in the next five to 10 years, will be studying a very different set of evaluation than we right. did. Looking at externalities. Absolutely. Yes, Paul and then uh, President uh, Santos. They won't uh, be external anymore. Definitely on, on, on the environment, agriculture, food, in general, uh, is a major part because it's over 20% of, of, of the problem, uh, per se. So you can, and if you then think that 30, 40% of food that is produced in the fields is not is lost somewhere, think about it. Uh, you have quite a part of the equation there. So, so much is now happening also about the, the, that discussion, uh, agriculture, food. Uh, R&D in our agriculture, if you think, uh, um, uh, the R&D in agriculture and food in general, uh, but agriculture upstream, is 1.5% of the total worldwide R&D spend. So we spend a lot of R&D in, in many issues that are covering the only part of the affluent part of the world. But 1.5% that touches uh, the major part, everybody has to eat, only 1.5%. So there's quite a lot of up, uh, upside there. There's a difference between pricing and valuing. The problem is when you say pricing, that's like you're going to have to pay. 
And then you start to have emotional discussions and, 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 and things like that, which is normal. But I think we should be able to value uh, uh, and, and build systems. For example, we, we give uh, water a value in our company so that we can justify investments for water reduction in our factories uh, and to have a an, an, an virtual return on investment per se. Uh, because that's, we have so much linked with water and water. Uh, that's why I also in the Water Resource Group and all that. There's so much. It's one of the biggest problems we have because that's now. And here, and not here in Switzerland, uh, right. after the snow we had, but, but in many countries, <laughs> it's, it's local. And so uh, I, I think this is a big difference between pricing and value. And, and, and I think we have to do that differentiation. If not, the discussion goes into emotional spirals, and that's very dangerous. Right. Well, President. I think that's a very important point, and one of the biggest challenges for countries uh, around the world, countries like Colombia. In our case, for example, the, the number one reason why uh, people are uh, destroying the rainforest is to raise cattle. And raising cattle, the way we're raising cattle is the worst possible uh, way in terms of climate change and in terms of productivity and income. There are, and we're starting a huge uh, program in that, other ways of raising cattle and producing milk uh, the Silvo Pastoli, I think it's called in, in I know in, in English also, uh, that you increase the income for the peasant, for the farmer, uh, three to seven times. You use much less land, and the pressure on the rainforest simply goes to zero. Uh, these type of programs have a specific incentive already uh, embedded because the income raises. Uh, uh, is increased tremendously, and it's a government's responsibility to promote that and hopefully private-public partnerships in bringing those type of uh, more healthy ways of producing food, and you produce more food, the world needs more food, uh, but in a better way. And I think right. this is a great challenge, and this is a very important point. Uh, we are suffering or we are uh, living through that at this very moment. Right. Well, we have a question over there. Oh, sorry, sorry, Paul, did you want to yeah, add? Yeah, well, very fast. Um, uh, animals uh, is, is a big <laughs> issue, and, and more and more people start to be aware of meat, and uh, uh, that's proteins. Proteins, you can bring vegetable proteins, and, and so we research it also, and there are even startup companies having and giving you a, 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 a vegetable uh, protein steak or hamburger, and you wouldn't say the difference. I think there is also a research and, and answers there that can uh, really give an answer towards that uh, environmental footprint. Uh, give and take, it is one-tenth vegetable proteins give one-tenth of an impact on, on the environment. So right. there's quite a lot of upsides if you still really start uh, uh, organizing around it. Consumers have to go along with it, but I think they will, uh, because uh, we have such a good products there that, that are vegetable-based. Right. Well, thank you. Hola, me voy a permitir hablar en español, sí. porque tiene un té. Okay. Mi nombre es Ana Ruth Villarreal, yo soy Global Shaper, también soy asesora a la vicepresidenta de Costa Rica y el presidente. Eh, casi no duermo esperando esta sesión, que me parece interesantísima. Eh, y bueno, Costa Rica ha aprendido mucho de Colombia, muchas gracias, presidente. Costa Rica ha aprendido uh, a lot from Colombia in terms of reducing poverty, and we managed to reduce our poverty thanks to your uh, strategy. Thank you, Mr. President. And also, we uh, managed to find a consensus between our three powers, along with the private sector, in order to advance the agenda of the SDGs. Having said that, I still um, have a question regarding the relationship between social and economic. Both elements go hand in hand. And our countries, the Latin American countries, have not yet understood it because we are not ready for the future of work. And five years from now, if we do not achieve to conciliate social and economic, we will not have progress. And I am um, worried about my family, my cousins, and parents that 
um, need to renew their knowledge, their skills, but we as governments have not yet understood it. And through the changes that many Latin American countries undergo, many countries will change their government in the upcoming months. I would like to hear from you, Mr. President, um, a few recommendations how to use public policies to deal with the issue of future of work. Where should we focus? Science, uh, vocational training, what shall we do? Thank you. Um, well, the, the biggest challenge that I think the world has right now, uh, the fourth revolution, industrial revolution, that's, I think, uh, the, the, the base of the discussion of this Davos meeting, um, is what's going to happen with the labor force and uh, countries like uh, Costa Rica, Colombia will have a tremendous challenge. But there's a lot of room still to make social progress, the fight against poverty, what uh, she was uh, mentioning, it's we applied something called the multi-dimensional index uh, that was developed by the Peace uh, Noble uh, of Economics, uh, I mean, Thiasen, we adopted in Colombia and has been very successful in reducing poverty. Uh, that is not incompatible. On the contrary, it's, it's a complement of public policies that uh, generate new uh, employment, more productive employment, and more formal employment. One of the challenges that Latin America has is formal employment. And there's, it's not incompatible. It's working in the right direction. And in the case of Colombia, we have produced in the last uh, seven years more than three and a half million new jobs. And we have reduced poverty by five million. Uh, and so there's not, and it's not mutually exclusive. On the contrary, they complement each other. And so I think uh, uh, there, the way, there are ways of making uh, the generation of employment completely compatible with social indicators and with economic indicators. Uh, so don't get discouraged. Uh, we shall continue <coughs> to work together in order to make that compatible. Right. Okay. Dr. Let Ling. Say something about this. You know, I do believe it's not only the government's effort to, to create the jobs and to make the training, make the education, but also the business. Can I take a very short example? We have uh, some projects, some, some theories in Indonesia, in other countries. You know, when I enter into Indonesia, you know, some rural countries that even the local residents, they have no power to use. So how can you, you know, have the qualified employees. But as our company, we have a, a very serious education or training plan to have all of these in the potential employees to come to China, to enter into our power station, give them three months or even half a year or even whole year training. And after that, after we finish the construction work and they back to the power stations, they can do all of the jobs very well. And so we create a lot of jobs position here. And also, we have them uh, qualified you know, workers. Uh, so uh, I can tell you that kind of uh, power station we have run. Number one power station at computation in Indonesia. So I do believe training and education is our responsibility. We can do it well. Right. You've I think youth employment is a time bomb, um, uh, and not only in Costa Rica, Latin America, but it's, it's in Europe, it's all over the place. Uh, it's a ticking time bomb, we're not uh, too much aware of it. Uh, we're trying to, to, to shape certain things, and I think there are so many initiatives of, um, that we have on Nestle and youth, but so many uh, governments and others are, are starting to really identify this as a ticking time bomb. Then in Latin America, inclusive uh, development is a big thing, but we are still I'm a little bit emotional about Latin America. I lived there for a long time, but but uh, um, uh, inclusive. So uh, we had always in Latin America, we're killing the engine. So at least then we are more equal. Uh, no, don't kill the engine, but be inclusive and make uh, uh, make the development shared with. But there is an initiative, I think, also in um, 
in uh, well the G20 in, in, in Argentina, etc. I think youth employment and employment in general is part of, of the agenda there, I think. And uh, also, the fourth industrial revolution, we say it's going to kill all jobs. No, true. The first industrial revolution, the second one, everybody says the same, and it has created jobs. You see, the world has to develop so much still. There's, we, we think the world stops with Western, uh, the Western part of it. It's not true. The world has to grow tremendously. That's going to need resource hands. We have to be wise in using them. And it needs labor and people involved in the productive dimensions to build that world. I don't think uh, there, 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 there should be uh, um, uh, problems with labor. But then we have to do our job. It is training. It is training in companies. It's creating jobs. Companies, private sector creates jobs, basically. That's, that's what they should do. Yeah. And uh, when government starts to create jobs, you have problems because you have to finance it out of a reduced source. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think we should give logic a chance and, and, and be consequent in our, in our acting. We are consequent in our talking, but acting. And I think companies, that's what I represent, can do quite a bit. And, and uh, we have to talk out of conviction, not out of convenience, I always say. Convenience means, well, it's nice to say, politically correct. Well, I, I, I try to talk about because that's what I believe in. I've been there. I've seen it. And, 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 and that's the purpose of our company. There's 340,000 people waking up in the morning and saying, hey, that's fine to work for a company like this. That right. is a little bit what you say, the base that uh, shapes and frames us. And I right. think in emerging markets, again, the next 10 years is critical. With what you talked about yesterday, about lifelong job, uh, lifelong training, um, Really critical, obviously, to um, to come to what you were um, you were outlining, but also um, technology can be a friend or a foe. We saw how how emerging markets with cell phones, yes, really, including in Latin America, jumped ahead. Uh, right now, only one out of two people have cell phones, um, and so that will be a huge huge thing with the SDGs whether you own or you don't own digital um, access. Right. Well, this conversation could go on a lot longer. There are so many things we've touched on. And part of the power of the conversation is that we've brought together people from different geographical areas and different sectors, both the public, the private, and the um, financial sector. And that really is part of the theme of the SDGs. But sadly, um, we have to wrap it now because um, we're at the end of the time. But thank you all very much indeed for taking part. And best of luck in pushing these forward. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.